integers or double or characters. So any type of primary data type you can use, but using only one variable name, you can access multiple data elements. So how it is possible? It is possible with the concept of indexes, right? So we can use the index. And uh, when I say the size of the array is five, so it, though it is five, but the index wise, it starts with zero. So if you want to access the first element, you have to refer the index of zero. Likewise, if you want to access the last, the fifth variable, you have to refer index four. Okay. So uh, I think I have uh, told you that like, you know, we can initialize the array uh, manually or the best way to initialize the array is to use looping concepts, right? So it's always better because, you know, you, the reason, the main reason of utilizing arrays is to avoid the lengthy code, okay, to avoid writing, declaring n number of variables, okay, and basically to make the programmer's life easy and to write optimized code, okay? So, you know, I have just uh, taken one example uh, just to recap, like, you know, whatever we have done yesterday, right? It is basically to store the student information and I'm referring only the single uh, one dimensional array only. Okay. So here, if you see in the main method, I have declared one integer array of roll number to store three roll numbers. So three students basically. And I'm going to store the marks of three subjects. Again, since marks can contain the floating or the decimal value, so I have declared with the float type. And total is again a float type and percentage also float type. So if you see all are, you know, kind of three size because I want to store three students information. Okay. And before starting the for loop, okay, the for loop is basically to accept the input data from the console for the roll number and marks as well. Okay. So since I wanted to repeat asking this information three times on the console, instead of writing this multiple times, I'm using for loop. Because I wanted to execute these set of instructions three times, okay? And I mentioned, uh, so here I could mention the for loop, loop counter equal to one and less than or equal to three. But the only reason why I have started with zero is because RS always starts with the zero index. So that's the reason I said, start with zero okay and whenever i accept the values from the console so if you see i am using that specific index to store the value so when the loop counter equal to zero and when you enter the values of roll number and three sub three different subjects so what happens here the first time you are storing the first roll number it's a loop counter. Loop counter is first, it is zero. So you are storing in roll number in roll number of zero index. And here you are storing physics of zero. Okay. And chemistry of zero, okay, also maths of zero. So when this loop iterates first time, I'm going to store the values of this roll number physics, mass chemistry in zero index. That means with the very first index, right? So if you, let's say the index is zero now, okay, you have entered some marks 10, 20, 30, okay. So this, these three values are stored now. Okay, of course we need roll number also. Okay. So the first time I stored these values, right? And when the loop goes again the next time, the loop value becomes one because I said loop plus plus. So zero to it will become one. 
So now again, the same set of statements gets repeated. However, the values will be stored in the index of one because the loop counter becomes one, right? And same way, third time it repeats, it will have roll number two, physics of two, chemistry of two, mass of two. So basically it will store the information in three different indexes of each array. So let's say now I have the values. Okay, I entered roll number two here. Okay, I'm just entering some values here. Roll number three. Okay, so I have entered these values now. Okay, so now see what I did next time. Okay, so the first for loop is to accept the values from the console. Okay, and second one is I wanted to derive the total marks obtained by the student and also what is the percentage of marks he scored. Okay, so here again I have introduced one more for loop. Okay, again I have three indexes, so I'm starting my loop with zero up to two. Okay. So here, if you see the formula, total equal to physics, chemistry, mass, okay? But since I have the three indexes, index 0, 1, 2, so first time I am storing the total value of 0, here if you see here, it looks like total of 0. In 0 index for total variable, okay, I need the values of physics of 0 index, chemistry of zero index and maths of zero index, right? So basically, I'm accessing these three values, math zero index, physics zero index, chemistry zero index, and I am storing the sum here, right? And then what I'm doing, I'm deriving percentage. So if I want to have the percentage, if you see, I am taking this total value. Total of zero contains the sum of these three subjects. So I'm taking the sum of three subjects. So here percentage of zero equal to total, which I have already derived from the previous statement divided by three. So that means by utilizing the arrays, okay, and by utilizing the loops, you are reducing a lot of variables in the program. And also, you are optimizing your code. Instead of writing 100 lines of code, okay, you are just using the for loop. You can very simplify the code. And also, it is very easy to understand. So, if it is, the code is optimized, it's very easy to read, okay, and it's very easy to debug also, if there is any issue. Okay. So, uh, clear with this, like, now how we are using the loops concept in the arrays for effective code. And at the end of the for again one. And his total percentage. So I already have the values of everything here. I just need to print the roll number. Okay. And average. Okay. So what I'm doing, I'm just again using the for loop. Okay. And roll number, I'm printing the roll number of zero index here and percentage of zero index here. So any questions like, no, uh, this, this is the one I think yesterday we have discussed before we wrapping up the call. So just wanted to repeat this program. Okay, let's see how it works. Okay, so it is asking for the roll number. I entered one. So basically, if you remember, guys, this is the zero index value. Roll number one, physics marks, chemistry, and maths. So now again, the second time loop started. Again, it is asking for the roll number. I said two. Again, it is asking for the third roll number. 
Okay. So now it is giving the rule number one, the percentage, rule number two percentage, and three percentage. Okay. So here, one more, uh, I'll tell you like one more thing here. So here, I have kept the logic separate. Okay, if you see input, I have kept a separate for loop. And for processing, I kept for separate for loop. And for printing, I kept separate for loop. If you require, you can move these two values, the processing also, okay, as part of accepting only within after accepting the value here itself you can calculate okay we really don't need to use this another for loop because anyway this is processing right inside processing and we are storing it in the array so there is nowhere we are displaying these values the displaying is happening at the last for loop so i will continue to keep like this but only the processing part i can still keep it in the input uh, array itself but i don't want to do the reason behind Okay, see when you accept the values, okay, after accepting, when you keep the processing also inside the loop, okay, of course, now it looks like very simple. There are only two statements, okay, but normally, if you keep the processing also inside the uh, input loop, right, what happens, you know, after executing, after taking these values, okay, to calculate the total and percentage and to store it in the array, it takes some time, right? It may be a fraction of seconds, but it takes some time, right? So what happens? Since the computer is trying to execute or trying to run these two statements, there is some kind of delay before accepting the next set of values because I have my code here, okay? So unless I execute this code, the control will not come to the beginning of the next iteration, right? So since this processing, if it takes a lot of time as an end user, so how do you feel like, you know, suppose you're trying to browse a page, okay? If it is taking a lot of time to load, so what do you feel? You feel very frustrated, right? So at the end user side, they should not feel that like, you no, know, the application is very slow, you know, it is not working as expected like that. That's why I try to avoid keeping the processing logic inside the acceptance, input access, input values. Okay, so I'll always try to separate. And that is the very reason, uh, do you guys know about like, you know, two tier architecture, three tier architecture? If you remember like, you now we have, we have the presentation zone Okay, which is basically, you know, the screens which are visible for the end user. It's kind of, a, you know, screens or UI, user interface. Okay. And we have the business layer. Okay. This is where actual all computing happens. The logic, business logic. Okay. And one more is database layer. This is actual the storing data storage. Okay, let's take the. Uh, uh, so if if your application, okay, the UI and the computing logic and data storage, if this is everything is in one place, it is called one tire. Okay, and if you keep the presentation, okay, in one place and business and data layer in another place, it is called two tire. So, the if you see right, uh, generally, uh, I'm just trying to look for one example. Should I, how should I explain this? Okay, let's let's take this. Okay, so uh, suppose if you are installing one application in your computer, okay, and 
you are storing the database in your computer and processing also happening in your computer that means all these three layers are in only in one place or in only one application or one one system that's why it is called single tier but if you keep the presentation zone only on your computer okay and whenever there is a, any processing required any business is required if you keep it in another server okay so this is a client machine that means the L, the end user machine okay server okay and also there is we are keeping one more server for data storage okay so presentation zone means the ua user interface okay this are if you see this excel it is the interface right this is where you are entering the values okay so i am entering some values okay so all this ua is is stored in your client in your machine okay but when you say equal to one plus one plus one okay that means it requires some kind of it requires some kind of processing right so if if it is a complex business logic which Normally, if you do, if you do, if you keep it in your server, it takes time to process, right? So basically, what we do is to make it lightweight, we move this the business logic into a another server. So whenever there is a calculation required, instead of doing everything within our own computer, we call the respect to server to do the calculations. And also after doing after entering all the values, if we wanted to store it somewhere right so you invoke another server to store the data so this is called three tier architecture so normally in previous days right everything is in one one place that is why it is one single tier then layer what they did presentation they kept in one server business layer and database layer kept in another server so it was two tier so now in the latest uh, you know, techniques we keep all three different places so it's like three tier architecture Okay, so here, guys, you know, yesterday uh, someone was, I'm, I'm not sure, someone was asking about the uh, stack overflow, right? Okay, and I told you that, you know, I have given one example about, you know, keeping some, you know, it is supposed to be storing only 20 elements, but, you know, it was trying to store 21 elements, and we get this, right? So let me show you how it works here. Suppose here, we know that we have all the arrays have size of three, that means we can access three different elements starting with index 0, index 1, index 2. Okay. Let's see. I'm trying to do roll number. Okay. I'm trying to assign the index 5 equal to 100. I'm just trying to do it. Okay. Uh, ideally, like you no know, roll number 5 is there here. If I, if I say roll number 5, what is our length of roll number? It's only three locations. But I said access fifth location let's see what happens okay so what is the error you see index out of range exception guys this is very very important question normally you know in a, in most of the interviews they ask when do you get index out of range exception so your range of array is only three but you are trying to access the range of 5, which is out of the declared range of 3. Okay. So if you try to access out of the array boundary, you get this exception. Okay. Index out of range exception. Okay. And uh, so similarly, so this is for the arrays, right? If it is arrays, if you declare out of if you declare the index which is not part of our array definition you get this one okay it's fine and similar way stack overflow right 
so in our uh, memory right so whenever we declare or whenever uh, we try to run the program right so the data is loaded into stack memory and what is the another memory instead we were discussing heap heap memory heap, heap, heap memory, memory. Yes. very very good okay so in generally right in generally if it is a 32 bit processing uh, computer okay uh, normally the the stack size is fixed it is 1 mb okay and if it is a 64 bit processor okay the stack size is 4 mb okay suppose you have your program you are trying to declare or you are trying to store more, more number of data in the memory okay that is in the ram what happens at some point of time you will not be in a position to store the values because already you queued up so many variables so many data and 1 mb is over already over and if it wants to store one more number it has to delete one of the variable or one of the data from the memory which may impact your program right because the the reason why i am storing the memory in the stack because i need those values to process my business logic okay so i have filled up my entire stack which reaches 1 mb okay now i am trying to add one more but my stack is already full okay if i wanted to store another value i have to remove one of the stack value here but you know that stack memory is only used whenever the va a variable is active because once the method is over we are removing that val values right removing from the variables from the stack memory that means there is no way you can remove the values or variable from the stack okay so that's why what computer does do is instead of you know ideally since it is not supposed to be removing any of the data from the stack instead it says that hey guys you know it's already 1 mb you have effectively utilized your stack memory there is i cannot accept any more so it, it it throws the error okay so let me show you Okay, I just like, you know, put a recursive method. First, I will show you like, you know, uh, how it works. You see, I'm starting. It is simply, you know, incrementing the numbers. If you see here, right? Just incrementing plus one. And it's completely going on adding the values. Okay. You see, it printed up to 14254 and it said process is terminated due to stack overflow exception. So basically your program is trying to okay add more number of variables to the stack memory but stack memory is already full it no longer accepts more values so instead of deleting the values from the stack ideally it should not be deleting from the stack because it is required that's why proactively it throws the error hey you know i am full i cannot accept any more this is called stack overflow so yesterday, you know, someone, I mean, Sai, I think Sai, right? Who asked? I don't know. So the reason why I was telling today is because I wanted to show you how this array index out of range works. Okay. The similar way. So array index out of range is for the arrays, whereas stack overflow is for the memory. Thanks, Vainu. Thank you. I asked, I asked you yesterday. Yeah, okay. No problem. And uh, one more thing, right? Uh, I don't know why this my location of my source got changed. Okay. Uh, Uh, 
okay i will show you uh, there are few functions available in the arrays okay so uh, you know that array is a a class okay and uh, every class has some kind of methods to make our life easy okay so similarly you know there are few important methods i wanted to uh, pass on to you so one is array dot sort sort is basically to sort the data elements which are available in the array sorting okay it's always a you know a ascending order okay and uh, there is one more method called reverse if we want to reverse the values whatever is there right just to array from to copy the values from one array to another array okay if you see here i have declared my integer array okay of 10 size okay so i am including 10 index 10 values here okay what is this breakpoint okay and since i can store 10 values here so my index is starting with 0 up to 9 okay so if since you, if you don't want to hard code your array size right okay there is one property which is called length okay so there is basically your array name is numbers okay so your array dot length okay if you see the length gets the total number of elements in all the dimensions of the array okay so instead of hard coding you can use this array dot length okay and i am trying to print all these values 0 to 9 okay then if you see you know these are all not in a, a specific order right not in the sorting order so i said array dot sort numbers okay guys if you see right if you see here i am using the array dot okay i'm using the the class name itself okay this is because the sort is a static method okay normally if it is a static method you do not require to create an instance of the class you can directly access the methods or variables from the static class just by including the class name okay i will i will come to the static classes you know the, probably after some time okay but just remember that if it is a static class you do not require to instantiate the object you can directly use the class name dot the method name okay so here you are using the sort method okay and for which array you wanted to sort for the numbers okay so the sorting is done with the sort method and again i am printing the same values just to ensure that the array is sorted or not okay and then i'm trying to do the reverse with the reverse method and same thing i'm trying to print whether the reverse is working or not okay and here one more is i have creating a another array of integer 10 it's called new numbers okay and we can copy the values from one array to another array so if you see the copy method this is the from source array this is the target array okay but we know that uh, my source contains only the five elements or so ten elements oh, let me define this like this that way okay i think there is a reason so i'm if you see i'm copying uh, from uh, numbers array to new numbers array only up to five elements okay i know we have 10 values here my array size is 10 but i wanted to copy only the first five values okay and then i am printing that values as well so let me see okay see this is the original uh, initialization of the array which is in not in a specific order okay and now you changed your array using the sort method okay so it sorted you see it's an ascending order and now you are printing in a reverse method so it's revert 96 to 1 okay and then you have created a new array and you are trying to or you try to copy the first five data elements 
so you see only the first five values have been copied and since remaining are still did not copy it so it has the default value of zero okay so here uh, so in order to get the length okay so there is two things you are using the array name dot length okay which is a property and you can also use a get length method so in order to get the length of your array you can use either property or the variable which is length and also a method get length okay so here guys uh, yesterday i was discussing about the debugging right right let me show you like you now because like you know in, uh, the beauty of debugging in the c++ is even you can see the all the values of the arrays okay uh, let me put a breakpoint somewhere here right okay so what is the function key to to add a breakpoint can someone recall yes f9 f9, f9. very good yeah friend very good okay so f9 i kept and once you kept once you add the breakpoint if you want to start the debugging you can use f what is that function key if you want to start the debugging f5 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 very good okay so i'm i pressed f5. f5 okay so here if you see this is my array numbers right okay see numbers okay integer of 10 if you click on here okay you see the values number of 0 to 9 so this can confirm that my index is always starts with 0 right and all the values have been showing here okay just wanted to show like you no know, you can access any any specific location of the array in the debugging mode also okay so we covered pretty much a single dimension array and also array methods we also covered uh, Okay, now let's let's move on to the two-dimensional array. I will just uh, take few examples. Okay, so you know right how two-dimensional array works. I think this also I explained. It's kind of a matrix, okay, which contains uh, like rows and columns. So you can declare how many rows you want and how many columns you want. So here I am declaring the matrix array of integer type. Okay, see if you see like you know, I kept comma here. That means you know I have two uh, parameters here. One is for row, one is for columns. Okay, so that is an integer type which is having three rows and three columns. Okay, and I said that you know always index starts with zero. So this is the the row index of zero, row index of one, row index of two. Similarly, column here zero, column one, column two. So since it is a two-dimensional array, if we want to access in a particular location, you have to use the the array name and you have to say the index. What is the row index? What is the column index? This is the row index 0, column index 0, 1, 2. Similarly, row index 1, column is 0, 1, 2. Row index is 2, column 0, 1, 2. Okay, and this is how it stores in the memory. So let me take, uh, oh, is it still in the debug mode? Let me remove this. Okay, so two dimensional array. Okay, so here if you see, it's a two-dimensional array of integer type. Array name is A, and it has three rows and four columns. That means how many elements total we have? Three into four. Twelve elements we are storing. Yeah, twelve elements. Okay, so here if you see, since it is three rows. 
okay so we have the index of 0 index of 1 index of 2 for the rows and for columns we have index of 0 index of 1 2 3 okay so here just just for illustration purposes i am just mentioning like you now how we can initialize the values okay so if you see the row number 1 i have initialized here okay 0 of 0 0 of 1 0 2 0 3 so guys like you know i can keep it here also you can I, I just you know to make it easily understandable i just mention everything in one row in in okay so you can declare like this also okay you know that semicolon is a, a statement separator okay so even if you keep in the same line compiler accepts okay it's it knows that okay this is the line is over so this it treats as a, a separate line only okay just to easily understandable i kept row wise initialization here okay just a, um, to make it easy so this is the row one okay so it, if you see row always zero 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 and the column value is zero one two three like this row number two and row number three okay and uh, so this just time uh, example to show that how to declare a two-dimensional array and how to initialize okay and all of you know that initializing this way is a very bad habit okay uh, because we cannot initialize if it contains more number of variables right and we always use the for uh, loops so here i'm just randomly trying to print the uh, location of two of two that means i'm trying to print this value okay 32 is the value which we expected so just to uh, initialize or declare initialize and how to accent print a specific array location and this is going crazy Let me show you the effective way of utilizing the loops. Okay. So here, a numbers array, which is, if you see here, right, I have directly done the declaration as well as initialization. If you see, I have declared the array name as numbers array. And I have already included the variables or the initial values also. So this is the first row. If you see here, right? Okay. This is our first row, which contains four elements, and second row and third row. That means we have three rows into four columns, three by four. Okay. And uh, here I have introduced the concept of loops here. So since it is a two-dimensional array, if you remember, you know, in the 1D array, we have used only one loop. But for the two-dimensional array, you have to use two loops, one nested with another. Why? Because we have rows as well as columns, right? And in the 1D array, the row number is always okay, static, right? Only one location. But in the 2D array, we have to use row comma column for two d arrays right in the one day in the one dimensional array we were saying like you know a of zero only because only one location yeah no, one quick question right? Anna. so yeah. in the real time scenario uh, for uh, any small use case uh, when do we get to use uh, 1d and 2d so how can we know that here we should use 1D and here we are supposed to use 2D? Okay, I will come to you. I will I will show you that you know, another one real time example. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, right. So here, so here uh, it's a two dimensional array. We are trying to store three rows and four columns. Okay, so here I am uh, trying to 
uh, since I need to access, okay, I, I was telling you, right? If it is single array, we are using like this. Why this is going? Okay, I don't know. Array one, I'm just taking, you are using the index here, right? Only one index. But if it is two dimensional array, okay, you are using index one and index two, or I would say row and column. Here only column you are using always. Column is zero, one, two, three, four, because row is always only one. But in the 2D array, we are using row and column. So if I want to access one particular element in the 2D array, I have to use array and column. So two variables. That's why I'm using two loops here. Okay, so I'm using in get length. Okay, so the first is for the row size. Second loop is for the column size. Okay, and for the first row or the first index equal to zero, I will be repeating this J value, the column value. So if you see right here, uh, three of four, right? So this one, it will start with zero, one, and two. And for this one, we start with zero, one, two, three. So first what happens, it will come to the, you know, this first for loop, okay? The I value become initialized with zero, okay? Then it comes to, the internal, the, the nested for loop, okay? And here again, j equal to one, j less than the get length. So length, if you see, right, length is always gives the, the size, the size of the array, right? So if it is giving four, if this is giving four, if you see, like, you know, I mentioned the less than four because I have my index starting with zero. So I cannot say j less than or equal to this size. I have to say less than, if you see less than the get length. Clear? So here also see less than get length. So ideally the length, the row size is three, right? Row size is three. The length of the row is three, right? That's why it says three. But since my index starts with zero, I, I have zero, one, two only. That's why I said less than three. So zero, one, two, like here, less than four, zero, one, two, three. Clear guys, am I confusing you too much? Clear way. Okay, yeah, thanks. Got it. So here, okay, yeah. So now you started with the row with the zero, okay? And the, the column is zero, one, two, three. So four times this for loop gets repeated, okay? So what do you do here? You access first zero of zero, then zero of one, then zero of two, then zero of three. Because my, this is four, so J is less than four. So up to three, I will access. So I have, I'm printing the first row, first index, second, first row, second index, first row, third index, and first row, fourth index. I'm printing this all four. And once this is done, once this internal for loop is done, okay, again the control goes to the the higher version, the above the above for loop, right? The upper for loop. And now the value index value is now one. So again it prints the row number one, prints zero, one, two, three. Once it is done, again it goes to the the another row, which is two, and it prints second row zero, one, two, three. So this is how you have to use. So the first for loop is for accessing the row index. Second for loop is to access the column index. Okay. And I, I repeat, I said indexing is always starts with zero. So, so you have to ensure that you're only accessing the required uh, positions or the required locations. So when you say get length, it gives the length of the array size, if it is row or column, okay? And since the length is, when, when it gives length, it will not look at the index size. It will simply look at the array size. 
it will not see okay if i say this get length right for the rows it will it will read okay this is the row number 1 okay this is row number 2 this is row number 3 so it says that the length of the, row, the three, there are three rows here however however since the index starts with zero okay and since we are using these loops to access the index location you see that we are accessing the index location by using variables that's why you have to say less than the get length less than the get length okay and one more thing guys here you see i'm using get length with zero and one okay so zero is to get the the row size one is to get the column size okay let me show you one more example you know uh, i just you know taken few examples if i walk through more number of examples it would be easy for you to digest yeah Just give me two minutes. Just look at the code. I will just be back in two minutes. guys i'm back okay so this is one more example uh this is simply i'm trying to uh, take two different uh, matrix and i'm trying to sum up okay so here if you see i have one two dimensional array but here if, if you just observe right here i have not uh, hard coded my row and column size okay instead I am asking the user to enter what should be your matrix size. Okay, so that's why I have two variables defined, row and column, and I'm trying to accept the values from the user. And since the user value from the console is always a string, I'm trying to convert using two in 32 function. Okay, so I have my values stored in row and column. Then I'm creating, see, I'm creating total three uh, three two dimensional arrays one is matrix one one is matrix two one is result matrix okay so here the first one is since i know my the row size and column size and since i need to accept the values for that matrix from the console okay i'm using again for loop here okay see index starts with zero okay and i said less than row not less than or equal to row less than column not less than or equal to column right so here since my i and j variables are variables okay so the first row it comes here and uh, based on the the columns size the second for loop gets executed and we whatever the value we are entering using read line i'm storing in the specific location of the matrix same way i am accessing 
or I'm entering the input for the second matrix as well. Okay. And uh, third one is I'm simply trying to add this uh, two two dimensional arrays. Okay. So I'm just using the same two for loops. One is for row, one is for column. And you see, I'm adding, I'm using this result matrix third array and storing the value from matrix one or matrix two. Sum up these two values and store it in the result matrix. Okay. So simply to put forward, where is my Excel? Okay. So here, right? Suppose this is the A matrix. Okay. Okay. I have uh, declared as a two dimensional array. Okay. And uh, this is B matrix. Okay. And again, a 2D array. This is the result matrix. Okay. Again, a 2D array. Let's say I will show you how it works. Okay, if you see, it's asking enter the rows and columns of matrices. So I will say two by two. Okay, so now it is two by two. So it is asking the elements for the first matrix. So I will say one, two, three, four. Okay, so here you are storing one, two is the first row and three and four. Okay, and now the second one. Six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. And the result is basically they're adding this one plus six, seven, six, two plus seven, nine, three plus eight, eleven, four plus nine, thirteen. So basically, what I'm trying to do in the programmatically is okay. So I have kept one loop to accept these values. Another loop to accept another array. And the third loop is to calculate or to sum the mat two matrices and store in the result. So I'm adding this value plus this value, storing it here. This value plus this value, storing it here. Likewise, under two also. Okay. So if you see for two dimensional array, just remember that you have to use two loops one for row, one for column. Okay. And always, since you're indexing, you have to always start with zero index, okay? And less than the size of the array, okay? Should not use less than or equal to, because in some uh, in some of the interviews, right? They will write, they will show you this code. They will say less than or equal to, okay? And they will ask you like, you know, what is wrong in this code? Or whether it is going to work or not, okay? You know, we normally think that, okay, I is less than or equal to rows, which is the row size, it's fine, right? So it's a, you know, it's a uh, tendency that like, you no, know, we feel that it's a right code, okay? But if you keep this one, what is that you are going to get? You're trying to access beyond the array boundary. So you get index out of bound error, okay? Okay, so uh, clear with this or any Questions on this 2D array? Yeah, in the line 18, 19, 20, uh, are we creating new three new objects? Or no? Yes, yes, three new objects. Okay. And, so... and and yesterday, yesterday I think, you know, uh, is that you? Uh, you were asking, someone is asking about where the arrays are stored in stack or heap, right? I mentioned uh, it is stored in stack, but you know, that is not right, actually. You know, I, again, I went back and checked, actually, because Arrays are, a, it's a, it's a instance of a array class, right? It's basically we are using array class, and we are trying to declare or instantiate the a new object using array. So as I mentioned in yesterday's class, heap memory is used for reference data types and also the objects. Okay. So yesterday I mentioned that arrays are stored in the stack memory, which is wrong. They are stored in the heap memory. Okay, so uh, what is your question now? Yeah, no. so is it mandatory to use uh, to create the object here? 18, 19, 20? 
Yeah, because one is to store the first matrix values. Second one is for the second matrix. Third one is to sum up the values. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Okay. Okay. And uh, right. And someone uh, was asking me uh, about the real time usage, right? Okay. Uh, you go to any online ticketing, uh, say movie tickets. How the how the you know seating represents? Yeah. You have A, B, C, D, right? And each row you have one to ten or one to forty seats, right? Yeah. No. Right. So it has representation of number of rows, and each row we have number of seats. So that is the if you want to access a particular seat in the movie, right? Okay. You need to know your row number, right? Which could be A or B or C, right? And then also you need to know the the seat number, whether it is one, two, or thirty or forty. So that is a typical real time example I can give you. Yeah, not bad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So pretty much we covered uh, arrays. Okay. And we'll move on to strings. Okay. So, yeah, strings. So normally, if you wanted to store one character in in our programming language in the C hash, you use a variable uh, data type called character data type to store one character. But in real time state scenarios, we have to store like our case right we have to store our full name okay so if you want to store more than one character okay so if you, your idea is to store more than one character in a variable so in that cases you have, you will go for a, a string okay so string is basically it's a a collection of characters okay and guys, remember string is a, a class. It is derived from a class. Okay, I will explain in, in further slides, but okay. So string is basically, uh, whenever you declare or initialize a string, it is going to create a object from a string class. Okay, normally the integer uh, variable, right? Normally they are, as typical standalone data types, it doesn't require any object to create. Whereas strings, if you want to start using the strings, you have to declare. If you want to declare, you have to instantiate from a class, string class. So string is an object. Okay, remember string is an object. So where the objects are stored in the memory? Stack or heap? Heap. Heap memory, okay? Yeah. So. Where, remember, simple, uh, just a thumb rule. Whenever you are referring a object, that means it is stored in the heap memory. Okay. And one more important concept here is it's again very much important question: mutability. Okay. So mutable or immutable. I think you might have heard this, uh, you know, word very frequently during the COVID COVID days, right? The virus getting muted like that, right? Okay. So same way, muted means if you have the ability to change the value, it is called mutable. If you do not have the ability to change the value, it is called immutable. So here I'm saying strings are immutable. So once you declare and initialize a value to the string, you cannot change that string value. It's called immutable. Okay, I will explain further like you know, how it works. Okay, let me take you to the next slide. So here, right, you have uh, a variable a object called str of string type. Okay, and first you assign a value dot net. Okay, okay, uh, let me show you in the Excel sheet. I think that would be easy. Okay, I think, okay, so here, this is your uh, string array, string object, okay? And uh, so you have heap memory here.
okay and you have your strike memory here okay so you say that you know string okay and uh, so whenever you in, you declare a string right so it is a object right so what happens is okay let's say this value you are assigning tetra just let's say okay so what happens is this is the location this is the memory location of the stack memory and this is the location of the heap memory okay so whenever you declare a string and define right so normally the value is stored in the heap memory right so let's say it picked up this particular cell okay six okay probably i will i will use a different one okay now see here okay so here you know stack memory always start from the lower section right so here it will say okay there is a variable called string okay it is a reference variable and it is pointing to 14 okay that means whenever you refer a string value here okay it since it is an object the actual value is stored in the heap memory and from stack memory you have a connection okay if i say a print string it will come here and since the reference address is 14 it goes to here and it will print this value okay and let's say suppose you said again you are changing the value of string here okay equal to computing okay See guys, what's happening is the same string object I'm using, but I change the value of computing. So what happens is in this case, it doesn't change the value of Tetra. Rather, it will create a new memory location. Okay, somewhere in the heap memory. Okay, and now here, this will be changed to 12. So what happened here? You are assigning a new string, a different string value. In that case, instead of deleting this particular string, it creates a new memory location and stores that value. This is called, so say technically speaking, you are changing the value of string and you are storing, but in the memory, is it getting deleted the whole value? No, right? It is still there in the memory cell. I did not delete, the memory is not cleared yet. That's why it's called immutable. So strings, using strings, whenever you change the value of a, uh, of a string, instead of using the same memory cell, it goes and uses a new different location and stores the new value. That is why it's called immutable. So you are having a new value at the same time, still it contains the old value in the memory. That's why it's called strings are immutable. Okay, so you will ask like, no, why... You know this whole big mess okay but i will i will come to you like you know why we are using this, that kind of concept okay so but is that the same case for integers or, or floats no right if you integer or store any value here suppose let's say integer okay i equal to 10 right okay it is a, a regular standalone data type i don't need heap memory at all okay and i will use here i equal to 10 okay i should use this one right i equal to 10 but down the line somewhere you modify the i value to 20 what happens the same memory the same stack memory the value is going to be changed to 20 i'm not creating a i'm not like you know i'm saying i equal to 10 here then i equal to 20 here, right i'm not saying like that what happening it's exactly trying to use the same memory location and updating the value to 20. So using the standard data types like integers, boolean, character, or float, you have the ability to change the value and you have the ability to use the same memory location. 
that's why it is called mutable except string all other types are immutable but strings are immutable because it always using a different memory location in the heap memory clear guys it's an interview question why the strings are uh, what is the concept of mute, immutable why yeah. i will come to the, i will come to next okay okay so now uh, fair enough so now we said that like you know whenever we are creating or initializing a different value it is going to have a new memory address okay but so good thing is you know this this makes the strings immutable okay but the bad part is your memory is going to be increased right whenever you change the value it is going to create a new one it is going to increase right so uh, just to reduce that uh, the memory load right they have come up a concept called string intern string intern means okay suppose somewhere down the line you mentioned string equal to again tetra somewhere down the line potentially okay, you said tetra then computing then you said tetra after some you know set of variables after set of some instructions okay that time what happens is it will not create another uh, new value here instead it looks at this uh, memory pool and see hey tetra is the new value but i could see already tetra is defined previously so instead of creating the new one why don't i use the value here so it will try to use the same value which is already defined here the memory cell 14 it will not create a new memory address here because the value is same so if the value is same and already available in the heap memory it will try to use the same value again instead of storing it in as a new location that is called string intern okay if you are assigning the same value again and again to a string variable then it uses string interning to improve the performance in this case rather than creating a new object it uses the same memory location but the when the value changes it will create a new fresh object and assign the value to the new object so if you are storing the same value again and again internally it has a mechanism to use this string inter okay and now you know another interview question why the strings are immutable okay so just listen carefully here here we declared first we are storing the value tetra okay and what is the size of the uh, um, total number of characters we have how many we have five here right okay and second time you are assigning a value of computing it's a nine right it's a nine characters okay so why the strings are made immutable is whenever you declare the integer or float or character you know the size of that variable if i say integer you know it's always two bytes if it is character it's always two bytes if it is boolean it is always one byte you know that but if you declare a string do you know the size of how many what is the number of bytes it is going to consume in the memory because if you see the program okay we have only mentioned we have only mentioned you know okay probably will will come to like you know okay here you see this i did not mention the size here i just only initialized with the value right no size of the string here okay so what i'm trying to say is that like you now whenever you initialize a string object okay it is always a fixed location fixed number of characters okay when i declare the string with the tetra in the heap memory it occupies five bytes or you know and it will always a fixed array and when you change that to a another value computing which is 10 characters is it my memory cell is good enough to hold this computing value no because tetra has less less number of characters whereas my new value has more number of characters since we have this difference whenever we initialize or whenever we change the string value there is always a possibility of the changes or variance in the, the size of the string that is the reason one of the reason 
why always strings are stored in a separate memory location okay so the first reason is strings are stored in a fixed array so first time it is stored in a five array second time it is stored in the array of 10 okay and that is one thing second thing is caching so using the string intern right using the string intern whenever you wanted to uh, you know access the previous value you know internally memory you know heap memory can go and scan if already the previous value is there it will try to assign the same value in the stack memory it will reference okay that is one of the reason why strings are immutable because it saves memory with string intern and the the, the very important uh, concept here is thread safety okay so th i think i have not introduced you guys about the threads okay but thread means same program okay multiple folks are trying to access the same program the same set of code you have okay and this piece of code around you know more than 10 people trying to access this code it's called multi threading okay i will uh, come back to you later in the classes but so multi threading means you have more than one thread running to for the same set of programs so one program you have 10 different people are trying to execute the program okay and if you see no deadlocks okay why it is no deadlock means so whenever you know suppose this is your program okay and 10 people are trying to access okay so whenever they wanted to you know uh, use a particular string in the program so what happens because they are trying to use the string here and they are creating a, a new instance, right? Whenever they create a new instance, obviously the heap memory for that particular string is different for one thread to another thread. 10 different threads, 10 different memory locations for the string value. That means nobody can intervene with other, other person's object. It's depend, independent to their particular thread only. That's why it's called thread safety. So if, if my thread is, if my thread, okay, this is thread up to thread 10, okay. So you are using string, okay, right? And another guy also using the string, but another guy also using string. But what happens? String, since string is a object, right? So every thread has their own object for string. Okay, so if I use this particular thread, okay, for particular string, other threads cannot access this particular string because this is particular to my thread only. That's why it's called no deadlock. Thread safety means, thread safety means basically, you know, what is the thread safety means is you try to execute the same program by multiple threads, but there should not be any impact to the, the way the program is supposed to work. Okay, so you execute one person or 10 person, 100 persons. The program should work as expected. There should not be any changes. You know, if one person trying to access and if another person, it should not give a different result, right? That is called thread safety. Okay, so this is one of the, probably you can say thread safety as one of the, the top reasons why strings are made immutable. First thread safety, then you say strings are always stored in a fixed array. And whenever you change the value, the fixed array may not be sufficient enough to store the new value because of the sizing limitations. That's why it always stores a new memory cell. So clear guys, the immutability. It's it's very, very important question for the interviews. Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. So let's uh, go to the examples. Really, I'm thinking of, you know, uh, coming and closing this arrays and uh, strings, but always, you know, it is, while going with explanations, it is taking time, actually. Okay, types, strings. Okay. Okay, so this is what I'm trying to explain here. Okay. So the first string, you have created with the tetra okay let me i think i have already mentioned this somewhere my other class okay so here 
to move this first. Okay, so here, where am I? Okay, so first is str1. Okay, it's a I'm creating an object for a string class tetra. Okay, since it is an object, it is getting stored in the heap memory. Okay, so I have stored this tetra in the memory location 205. So I will say str1. Okay, refer 205. Okay. Because if, if str1 comes here, it goes to refer 205, it will go to the heap memory and try to access this value. Now what I did, I have changed my string value, str1 equal to str1 plus competing. That means I am adding competing word to this tetra. Okay, so I have created a one more uh, memory location in the heap, tetra competing 204. Okay, since the variable name is same, string is name here, here I will change it to 204 because it's the same variable, right? String one, string one. So I'm just changing the pointer from 205 to 204. Okay, and this value still remains in the heap memory. And then I said str2 equal to str1. Okay, I am cloning the object str1 to str2. That means I will have str2 here as a, another object, okay? And this is basically, it's a, it is referencing str1, right? So we, what is str1 value here? 204, okay? And now then, I'm using another str3 to store tetra computing USA. So tetra computing USA is a 203 address, okay? So I will have str3 referencing 203, okay? And then I said str4 equal to tetra, okay? str4 here, okay? So here, since this tetra word is already defined in the heap memory here, okay? It will not create a separate uh, stories. Rather, it will try to use the same location, which is 205. This is what I was trying to explain in the string intern, right? If the value is already there in the heap memory, it will try to use the value instead of storing as a, a fresh copy. Okay, so these are like, you know, how, how it represents the string values. Effective use of stack and heap memory. Clear, guys? Yeah. Okay. So now, uh, okay, now, Let's take uh, some example. Okay, so you have this uh, Tetra competing USA. Okay, now you wanted to change the value from USA to India or UK. That means you want to do some kind of modifications to the existing string. Okay, so since you know using the strings, you cannot change you know the lengths, right? So you, it's very difficult to manipulate because whenever you try to manipulate, whenever you're trying to use the string, it always uses a new instance and it will try to modify over there. Okay, so to avoid this these issues with the strings, right? You know, they have a new concept called string builder. With the string builder, you can do you know variety of things with the strings. Let me show you. Okay, string builder. All right, so basically, as you see, there are some limitations with the strings due to its immutability, right? And if you wanted to play around with the strings, if you wanted to modify the value, okay, if you want to, you know, change it, okay, what normally if you use strings, uh, if you try to change what happens, it is creating a new instance, okay, it is wasting the memory. And, you know, if you wanted to do too much of, you know, play around with the strings, you know, practically it is not a good way to use strings because it eats up your heap memory a lot. 
okay so if you have to do any kind of string manipulations instead of using strings use string builder okay it's again a class string builder is another it's again a class okay so for this class i am defining a object s okay and uh, the size of the string is 50 characters okay and i'm initializing the value with hello okay string builder is another class s is the object of string builder 50 characters with a hello value okay so now you see i tried to print the value it should print hello here okay and now if you see i said append string dot append okay for the s is the string i'm using append method append means it will append the what are the value you mentioned to the existing string that means it becomes hello tetra okay and again i have appended with computing so it will become hello tetra computing you know what append means adding the string adding the value at the end appending the value okay so first it is hello then hello tetra then hello tetra computing imagine if you wanted to do this with the strings what happens ideally it will create three three separate instances one for hello one for hello tetra one for hello tetra computing so three different memory locations but using string builder you're using only the same memory location okay and you are manipulating the value in the same memory location so hello tetra computing now i see i added one more thing usa so hello tetra computing usa okay so fair enough we have, we have done a lot of appending here okay now i am using one more method called replace so if you wanted to scan your string and wanted to replace any particular character or words you can use replace method so here simply i'm saying hey whenever you find the string usa in the in the in my string change it to ind so instead of printing hello tetra computing usa it will print hello tetra computing india okay and again you know i'm using instead of india use australia okay and it also has a one more method to remove any particular uh, positions so when i say remove 0 to 6 means starting with the zero index remove first six characters guys remember strings are stored in an array only okay because string means more than one character so if you wanted to store more than one character of same time you use arrays right so internally strings use arrays only okay let me run okay you see first hello hello tetra hello tetra computing hello tetra computing usa now i am changing usa to india okay and india to australia then i said remove first six characters right it removed first six characters and printed tetra computing australia so what i'm trying to say is that like you know if we wanted to manipulate your strings instead of using the string object use string builder object this way you can save your memory space clear guys yes well okay okay yeah so, clear okay so i will just take another 5 minutes i know we are already you know over over our time is already 7 i mean it's already for me it's already 1 minute over the scheduled time but i will just take another 5 minutes i wanted to show one last thing then we can wrap it up for the day see guys like you know i am taking more number of examples see ideally if you want to master any programming language you need to write a lot of programs okay so as a programmer yeah. you are supposed to do the writing programming only right so the yeah. more you practice right the more you familiar okay see once your hands are comfortable on the coding part right okay there is there is no stop for you okay so always like you know my my coaching is always you know i will try to explain different different scenarios okay 
and that's how like you now you will able to grab the concepts quickly because you know theory part is always like you know i mean we will spend time on theory okay but i will only cover what exactly you require for the theory but mostly you know my mine is mostly towards the hands on only and one more thing i am going to share this decks and also i will try to zip it all these uh, programs and i will share with you uh, and i will share the link also you can download and uh, you know you can copy into your repository and start exploring these programs okay so one thing i wanted to okay command line argument set right? okay so so far like you know we are accepting the values from the console right from the command prompt you are accepting the values okay but but you know uh, if you see look at the main method here right okay what do you see with this parameters this is a string class and the string object name is arguments that means main method has the ability to accept the string type of input values right it's a string class arguments is the instance or object which can accept string type values okay so fair enough you have the ability to accept the values for the main method itself then how do we do if you want to pass some values through main method remember so far we have been declaring we have been issuing the console dot read line statements to read from the console but rather here before executing the program itself i should have the ability to load the values okay so how you can do is okay click on this uh, program here right click you go to properties here okay okay here if you see the debug here in the debug here see command line arguments okay so i am giving uh, two values here one is 10 one is 20.5 i'm giving two values here okay so here now when my program is going to run it will pick up two values and it will pass through main method okay and uh, you know that Uh, array is always starts with zero. Okay, so it's a string of array here. If you see, arguments was zero, arguments one. So zero index and one index. So what are the value we are passing through the main method? I'm trying to store it in the argument one and argument two. Okay, arguments is the array of string type. I'm passing two. values arguments of zero index and arguments of one index you see previously we were giving the value the input from the console but now i have declared in the properties only okay so when the program executed it picked up the two values from the properties and argument zero contains the first value 10 and argument one the second value contains 20.5 So normally, when do we use right this one? Uh, see, uh, typically, what happens is, uh, uh, let's take the user ID. Okay, so whenever you know you launch your application, it uses your user ID, right? The user ID is a common across all the programs across the application. So it's standard. And also, suppose a versioning, right? You know your software version. Okay. so you can mention that software version okay and that is static value right and if you want to pass some connection string some database connection string you can use that so normally normally the values which are more common are generic across your application or across your programs those kind of values we normally pass through command line arguments okay so fair enough i think you know uh, i will put a stop here but before we wrap up any questions on the two dimensional arrays or strings or string builders so topics are very very important guys okay so why is, why strings are immutable what is the reason okay 
and how to avoid using the string builder and why index is starts with zero not one all those things always remember okay and also array index out of boundary which if you try to access the index value which is not there in the array okay and also the stack overflow example where like normally if it is 32 bit the stack size is 1 mb if it is 64 bit the stack size is 4 mb so if you try to put more number of values or, or variables in the main memory at some point of time the memory gets full and there is no ability to load additional values that time you get the stack overflow okay so just a quick recap for today's session uh, we'll just wait for one minute to see if there is any questions from anyone no questions all right then okay so i will uh, i will store this uh, my uh, the ppt and also this uh, source codes and i will send you the location in the uh, group chat okay i will try to keep it in my google drive and i will share you the location yeah and i was about to ask you if you can share us the examples that would be really helpful on yeah, 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 definitely, definitely, definitely. Okay, so you copy them into your uh, your local repo and you can access them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Anna. Okay. okay, yeah, anna. thanks for the meeting. Anna. Yeah, okay, thank you. Anna. Thanks okay, anna. yeah, yeah, thank you so much. And we'll keep uh, meeting tomorrow, same time. Okay, yeah, anna. have a yeah, good rest of the day. Yeah. You too, anna. bye. Yeah, thanks, bye.